Hey there, thanks for checking out this message at Oasis Church. At the end of this video, if you haven't already done so, please take a moment and download our free Oasis Church app. It's where you can access all our recent messages. And actually, our app is the easiest way to share all this content with a friend and the best way to keep up with everything going on around here at Oasis. But most importantly, we hope the following message inspires you to take the next step in your faith journey. Enjoy. Well, uh, we are wrapping up this series today called Knowing God, and, and it's been all about the Trinity. It's been about um, the belief that we have, that what we see in the Bible is that uh, when you open these six, six books, you have a God revealing himself. This is not stuff we're making up. It's a God unveiling and revealing himself, and we find a God who is three in one. He's uh, eternally existent in three persons, one God. And there's a bit of a mystery as we approach that. I'm not going to be able to explain that mystery to you. I've been saying each week that a God that's big enough for our worship and our, our attention and our devotion is probably not small enough to, for us to understand with all the dimensions and limitations we have here. So we approach this in faith and in mystery. But uh, this has been a series about how do we do that? How do we know him? How has he taught us to connect with him? And today, God the Holy Spirit And uh, this is weird for maybe for some of you if you're new to church, but it's central for people who are Christians is that as human beings, we have a spirit. We we are spiritual beings. And uh, as we invite Jesus into our life, his spirit actually comes to live inside us. He interacts with us. He communes with us. And we, we, our spirit connects with his. And so being a Christian, it's not just, hey, you got to believe some things. Hey, you got to do some things. There's some morals. There's some, you know, doctrine. But it's actually the primary, that's what it looks like from the outside. But from the inside, being a Christian is an experience of the Holy Spirit's power. And that shows up in different ways at different times in our life and different ways for, for each of us. Um, one writer in the New Testament called it uh, this experience love surpassing knowledge, which basically is you have this experience of God's love that it doesn't make sense. Other times it's joy when nothing really should be joyful in your life. You're just grateful because you know God's one day going to redeem this world and he's got a plan for you and all the details of your life are in his hands. So there's this joy that wells up. Other times it's peace when there's no reason for peace. Sometimes it's just this deep knowing that God is with us. But that's what it means. That's the primary experience of what it means to be a Christian. It's not just some beliefs and some actions, but these things are confirmed to our hearts. And the significance, I think, is growing on this more and more and more. Uh, the way I'll introduce this topic is loneliness. The, the, that's why the, the Holy, Holy Spirit is so important. This is such an epidemic in modern Western society that um, many of you will know this in England. They actually have a minister of loneliness. That's like a government minister, just like they have a minister of health care, you know, and a minister whose portfolio is justice and, and the economy um, and defense. One is now a minister of loneliness. It's such a problem with so many people. And there was a news article some time ago that said, you know, when we think of loneliness in our society, we often think of like maybe an 85-year-old person in their retirement living with no one calling them. But more often than not, sometimes the image of loneliness is a 24-year-old at a bar desperately trying to connect with someone else. And it's this universal phenomenon that all of us will do with. Mother Teresa actually said this, living in one of the most crowded cities in the world. She said, the greatest problem in the world is not starvation, it's loneliness. And more than just being alone on a Friday or a Saturday night, probably all of us can relate to the experience of, well, I love what one writer called a sense of cosmic loneliness, where even if you're in a room and you got your closest friends there, and the room can be crowded with your closest friends, there's still this kind of loneliness. And he described it as this feeling of living in God's world without God. 
or a homesickness for God, this cosmic loneliness. And the answer to this experience that we have is the Holy Spirit given to us to fill us up, that we'd never be alone, that he would be with us. And there's no better place to learn about who the Holy Spirit is and what he does than um, in John, as Sherry read for us from John 14 to 17, she just read a little bit of those chapters. But this is often called Jesus' upper room discourse. He's teaching the night before he's going to go to the cross, the night before he's going to die. And when you're talking to someone that just has hours left, you know that they're not, you're not talking about the weather, right? You're not saying, hey, did you see the Jets game on Friday? You're talking about stuff that's vitally important. And for Jesus, he addresses the disciples and the topic of choice. And he says, this is vitally important. This is what you need to know. And he's talking to them about the Holy Spirit, this one that he would send. And so it's really all about who is the Holy Spirit? What, what, what is this this thing that he's promising. And Jesus said this. Let me repeat some of the words Sherry read. Uh, I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate. Remember that phrase. We're going to come back to that. Who will never leave you. He is the Holy Spirit who leads into all truth. And so the first thing that we learn from Jesus' teaching is that the Holy Spirit is a person. He's not a vague force like in Star Wars, you know, where he's this nebulous kind of power. It's not an it. But the Holy Spirit as a person means that just like a person, you can talk to them. Uh, That's true of the Holy Spirit. The, the, The Holy Spirit thinks. He loves. The Bible talks about, in the book of Acts, about the Holy Spirit being grieved, that something just bothered him, right, to, um, that he's been outraged at times. And this matters, right, because you can't really know the force of gravity, right? You can't, you know, about it. You can't, like, be friends with the force of gravity. You can't, you can know about the force of magnetism, but you can't know the force of magnetism. But Jesus is saying, hey, what I am sending to you, it's a person. You can interact with him. You can connect with him, relate to him, and respond. And yet at the same time, it's very, very clear that Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit that's being sent is fully God. He is God. Jesus says, I'm going to send you another advocate, this word for another. There's two Greek words actually for another in the Koine Greek, which the New Testament was written in. And um, one of them means another of a different substance. This word, another, means another of the exact same substance. I'm sending you something just like me. Now realize the significance of this. If you were here last week, we looked at Jesus, God the Son, who, you know, here's this guy who had the highest ethical teaching the world has ever seen, but also said, I'm God, right? He claimed to be God among us. He claimed to be able to forgive sins. He said, I am the full creator God among you. Now he has the audacity to say, I'm leaving, but I'm sending to you someone just like me. Fully God. And and that is what Jesus taught his disciples that night. He said, I'm not going to abandon you. I'm not going to abandon you as orphans. I'm going to do something about that. And so the theme is, hey, I'm leaving you. Again, this is the night before he dies. And he says, I'm not going to abandon you. And he says, we, my father will love them. And we will come and make our home with each of them. Each, it's kind of weird. He's talking about the disciples who were there in the third person. But also us, all people who would follow after him. And He said, I'm leaving, but the Holy Spirit's going to come. And with the Holy Spirit, I'm coming with him. And the Father, God the Father is coming too. And again, we come to this dizzying doctrine of the Trinity, three in one. There's a mystery to that. And I just accept it because this is what Jesus taught, right? If you can raise yourself from the dead, I'm going to go with you about what you say about a lot of things. But for today, here's what I want you to think about. This one implication, that when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside us, God himself comes to dwell inside of you. The fullness of the triune God comes right into the middle of your life. There's an old scholar, his name is J.I. Packer, who was a British guy. He taught in Vancouver for a long time. And he asked this question. He said, have you been melted? That's a good word. Has your heart been melted by the joy and awe and wonder and knowledge of who has come to live in your life? Has your heart been melted by just... What we're given as Christians, this priceless gift. If you're a Lord of the Rings fan, there's this one scene in the book and in the movie where uh, Bilbo, this older character, gives to his nephew, Frodo, this coat, this chainmail coat. And Frodo just says, thank you, and he puts it on, and underneath is like, you know, an old, ugly old cloak he's wearing for traveling. And later on, you overhear that the cloak, this, this chainmail uh, shirt, cloak that was given to him is made of this special steel called mithril, and, and its worth was probably more than his whole province, more than the whole shire. And that same idea 
looking at, that's the perfect idea to think about what has been given to you. A gift of greater value than this whole earth has been given by God to live inside you. Has your heart been melted by that? Peter wrote to the church about the significance, trying to help them grasp this. And he said, you may become partakers of the divine nature, that God himself takes up residence in every follower of his. Every person that accepts Jesus, God gives you this gift. And if that's true, it means that there is no wound so deep that God cannot heal it. There's no brokenness that's so beyond repair that God cannot fix it. There's no binding habit, and if you just feel like I'm addicted and I can't stop and I'm never going to stop, there's no binding habit that cannot be broken. In a very real way, Jesus was saying, you will never be alone. This other advocate that I'm sending, he will never leave you. And in a very real sense, that is true of Christians, where you are never alone. And some of you, if we were to pass the microphone around, could testify to that. You would say, I had a season of my life where it felt like everyone left me because they did. And maybe you were divorced and alone in your house, or maybe a season when you're in college and all your friends left you. And you would say, but I wasn't alone. God met me there, and I felt his comfort. And in a very real sense, a follower of Jesus is never alone. And that is exactly why Jesus said to his followers, it is good for you. It is for your good that I'm going away. That would have been inconceivable to them. How could it be good if you're going to leave us? And Jesus said, unless I go away, the advocate will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. That in some way, in some way, they couldn't understand. And we still don't fully get this. It's a mystery. The Holy Spirit was going to carry on the ministry of Jesus in an enhanced way. And that's what we see when the Holy Spirit is given. That all of a sudden, the mission of Jesus lives on in every one of his followers. They are taking his message. They are bringing deliverance to people as they testify to what Jesus can do. And the Holy Spirit is now without barriers being released on his followers. And it's true today. It's true of those followers in the book of Acts. And it's true today for me for you, for anyone that calls themselves a follower of Jesus. It's an amazing, amazing idea. God himself comes to live inside you. Well, the next question is, well, what does that mean? What, what does he do? That's the next question. What does the Holy Spirit do when he comes to live inside us? And there are many things we could say, but let me just leave you with, a, uh, not leave you, but introduce you to uh, a few different things that the Holy Spirit does. One of them, we're taught very clearly in Jesus' words, is that the Holy Spirit is going to be a teacher that leads us into all truth. Now, there are two ways this shows up. One, um, Uh, Let me just first read this and I'll get to it. This is Jesus' words. He will teach you everything and remind you of everything I have told you. That's what the Spirit's going to do. This is a two-layer promise. One of the ways we believe this is true is that God guided the people who wrote the New Testament. And and the apostles remembered Jesus' words, recorded them, and then guided the church in selecting these documents to be preserved. These 27 independent documents that were brought into our New Testament. That wasn't of their own. God guided them. But also, the other layer is that the Holy Spirit comes and lives inside of us, and he gives us the, the ability to understand God's truth. Some of you, you know exactly what I'm talking about, because you were born in church, maybe you were raised in church, and yet any time the Bible's read or someone was up here like me talking, it kind of sounded like the teacher in Peanuts, you know? It was like that wah, 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 wah. wah. And it just was like, oh, kill me now, right, whatever. But then you met Christ, and, and the Holy Spirit came to live inside, and you had like true faith. You came to actual vital faith where you, Peter says, it's like you're born again, where everything is new, and it's like someone turned on the light on the Bible, and all of a sudden, you understood things, and you saw things you'd never seen. And if you ever heard of Pastor Vincenzo's story, that's exactly his story of how he came, when he came to faith, his wife, Marcella, was making dinner, and she was offended because he just couldn't stop reading, and he just, yeah, I, I just can't. And, and some of you could say that, that just... All of a sudden, the Bible made sense to you, and you felt like it was God's word spoken directly to you. There's a, there's a really interesting guy named Jonathan Edwards who um, was a philosopher. He was a pastor in New York City a few hundred years ago, and um, a lot of people think he was one of the smartest people to have ever lived. Like his philosophy is that good. But he said this about his experience with the Bible. He said, I have the greatest delight in the Holy Scriptures. Oftentimes in reading it, every word seemed to touch my heart. It seemed often to see so much light exhibited by every sentence, so much refreshing food communicated that I could not get along in reading it, often dwelling on one sentence to see the wonders contained within. And if you have the Holy Spirit living in you, what I'm reading is not completely foreign to you, right? Maybe not exactly like what he said, but you know that. You've experienced that where the Holy Spirit is making these words on a text alive to you. 
And, and, and the Holy Spirit is making them life and is making them power. That's one of the things that Jesus said they would do. He would, he would be our teacher. But it's even better, or it goes beyond that. Jesus said that this Holy Spirit would be your ultimate friend. Now here's why I, I, I use that term, your ultimate friend. Um, the word, this word that in the translation that was read to us today says the word advocate. Uh, there's a number of different ways that this word can be translated here. If you want to go to Jesus' words here, he says, I'm going to send the advocate as my representative. There's a, I put up a chart for, it's a tough word to get from Greek into English. And uh, sometimes it's translated as counselor, but that's a little bit too formal because you're not paying this guy 200 bucks an hour and then you know, he leaves once you're done and kicks you out, right? It's comforter, he comforts you, but that's a little too soft. He's a little bit like an encourager. He's like a helper. And, and all of these, maybe if you were to line up your Bibles over lunch, your different translations, maybe each one of those words might be in there. And that's why I said it's the ultimate friend because um, he's better than any friend that you may have. Some of you have some great friends but you don't have a friend like this. Maybe you even say, like, my life group's like my greatest friend. Um, you know, nothing like this, though, where all of our friends eventually leave us, right? Through death, through fights, through moving around. Uh, the Greek word that's so hard to translate is this word parakletos. And most words don't work like this, but this one kind of does, where this, you get, see that word parallel, where there's this one who's going to walk alongside us. He's going to be always with us. He's going to be loyal to the end. He's never going to lead us. But then the second word is that word um, uh, kaleo, which is the word to argue or declare. And he's going to come alongside us, and he's going to argue with the enemies and the lies of our heart, the enemies of our heart. And, and this shows up in two ways. One of the ways this happens is the Holy Spirit comes alongside when it's needed, and, and he's this ultimate friend who says, hey, you're a sinner. You've messed up. You, you, you have failed, and you need to get God's mercy. And so take responsibility. And, and that's what good friends do, right? Friends will show you where you're blind to your own mistakes and where you're blind to your own needs and, and, and things you can't see. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. But the other thing is, and this is weird, but our hearts not only are blind and um, not only have a hard time believing that we're as sinful as we are, but they also have a hard time believing that we're as loved and valuable and cherished as we are. It's like our hearts are idiots, okay? It's like all of this happens sometimes in one day, in one hour, right? And so the Holy Spirit comes along, and not only does it say, hey, you got to confess, but it says, hey, you're a child of God. You're not living loved. You, you, you are so accepted and so prized. And, and, and there's this verse in 1 John that says, when our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our hearts. It's speaking of what the Holy Spirit does. We're just weighed down, and we can't believe we'd ever be accepted or loved. The Holy Spirit comes along and says, hey, God's greater than, you're, you're not the ultimate verdict on your own life. God's court is higher than your court. C.S. Lewis has this great line where he says, when we don't forgive ourselves, it's like we're setting up our opinion as a higher court than God's, for, than God's court and his forgiveness, right? And all friends eventually will give up, but the Holy Spirit never will. And he will tell you things that are too hard and too bad for you to believe about yourself. And you'll say, yeah, those, it's true. That's the damage sin has done in your life. But at the same time, he'll tell you things that are too wonderful for you to believe that you're that loved and you're that cherished. That's the gospel, that our, it, things are worse than we could have imagined because of our sins. But things are better than we could have ever hoped for because of what God has done for us. He's the ultimate friend. In the ancient world, if there was a small ship that was on the waves and just getting in real trouble, they would often send out a big ship to draw alongside that ship and lead the small ship into the harbor. And that big ship was called the Paracletos, the one that comes alongside. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. And I don't know what you're facing today. Uh, maybe it's fear, disappointment, guilt, bitterness, hurts. But the Holy Spirit has been given to help us through whatever we face. I remember years ago going to, uh, I was just so anxious about, you know, some situations in life, just they have no, what does progress look like, right? Like, I don't even know what end is up. And I just went to see an old friend. It was just this wise friend of mine. I was like, hey, like, I got some well thought out questions. I'm going to take half an hour of your time. And I remember leaving his house and um, nothing had changed in the situation, but I felt different because I had had this moment with a wise counselor. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. That's what he gives. Life sometimes feels like just a series of challenges, one after another after another. And the promise of the Holy Spirit given is that you do not have to go through this alone. 
He is an ultimate friend who will be with you every step of the way. What does the Holy Spirit do? He's our teacher. He's our ultimate friend. But also, he will point you to Jesus. Jesus spoke of this very clearly where he said, he will testify about me. I'm going to send you the Spirit, and he will tell you about me. And, and maybe you say, well, I haven't heard much of the Holy Spirit. He doesn't draw attention to himself. He's often spoken of having like a floodlight ministry where he shines his attention, the attention on to Jesus. You say, well, how does that work? What does that actually look like in my life? Uh, I told you we'd come back to this phrase here of Jesus where he said, um, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate who will never leave you. And, and so it says there's two advocates, okay? Let me come back to the second advocate, the Holy Spirit. Let's talk about the first advocate for a second. Um, this is what First John writes. He says, we have an advocate. We have someone who advocates, who argues on our behalf, who pleads our case before the Father. The righteous judge. One day we all face judgment. Who is this? He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. And so Jesus is this first advocate who sacrificed on our behalf. He pleads our case before God the Father. And the way, a, a great thought experiment to think about this, and if you've been around here, I've shared this with you many times, but it's so helpful. If you think about our repetitive sins and the things you say, I'm never going to do that again, and then you do that again, right? And I say, I, I won't do that, and then you fail again. And, and if, you, if you think about Jesus as our advocate before God the Father, I used to think, again, this is not how it goes, but I used to think it kind of was like this, where Jesus, God the Son, is before God the Father, and he's saying, it's about Dustin, again, again, and uh, yeah, he did it yesterday, and I know he promised yesterday he'd never do it again, but he did it again, and he'll likely do it again tomorrow, but um, and it's like God the Father's like, well, you know, what are we going to do? And, and Jesus is like, well, what if we just give him one more chance? And, and he'll likely do it again, but let's just, and like, it's like God the Father's like, well, all right. And Jesus is like a defense attorney with no case, right? He's like begging for mercy. That's not what's going on here. That's not what John is saying. Look at this again. It says, there is a, Jesus is our advocate. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins. Jesus is before God the Father, not begging for mercy, but saying, a sacrifice has been made. It's about Dustin, and it is again, you know, and it's bad, right? But you can't have two payments for one sin, and I have paid for his sin. I have sacrificed for him. And Jesus is before God the Father, pleading not for mercy, but he's pleading the justice of God. Justice is now on our side. And the, the justice of God, it's like the mountains. If the, it, nothing can move that. It's, it's an infallible case. He is before God the Father pleading not my good behavior or my promise of that. He is pleading his substitution on our behalf. The first advocate is in heaven pleading our case, but the second advocate that Jesus spoke about is in our hearts. And he's saying, remember what Christ has done. Look at him pleading your case. Look at the cross. Look how loved you are. Look at how willing God was to sacrifice on your behalf. And if that idea moves you at all, if anything moved you, as I was saying, you know, Jesus pleading our case, that is the second advocate doing his work. He's working inside us saying, look what Christ has done. And the Holy Spirit, as this advocate, will give you unbreakable peace from this unbreakable case of God's sacrifice on our behalf. That is what he's willing to give us. Now, there's two ways that this should really land in our life. Um, if you want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, notice the incredible unselfishness and the divine selflessness, the humility in, in God himself, right? Here you have God the Father giving his treasure, God the Son. You have God the Son emptying himself. It says in Philippians 2 that Jesus took on the nature of, of a servant, of a slave. He emptied himself, even being obedient to death on a cross. And then you have the Holy Spirit, not promoting himself, but promoting Jesus, God the Son. Is this incredible you first type of love, this submissive type of love inside the Godhead, where for all eternity, God the Father has been, you know, doing this in this form of love for God the Son, and God the Son has been doing this for the Holy Spirit. And there's this dance of submission and love. That is the primary power in, I don't want to say the universe that he's created, but that's the primary power that exists. It's not even power, it's love. Right in the Godhead. This is the God we serve. And so I ask you, if you're always promoting yourself, 
You know, some of us, you look at our Instagram feeds and no good deed has gone untweeted, right? It's just, it's all there. If you are perpetually offended when you are not given your credit that is due and you're not mentioned, stop promoting yourself. Become like the one who lives inside you. Humble yourself and watch what the Holy Spirit does in your life. That's one way this should land in us. But the other side is also, if you are like just so low where you say, I just feel like an imposter and I just feel so much rejection and self-loathing and a failure, the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and says, hey, you're a child of God. God's grace has given you everything. Not that you've earned it, but Christ has done this. You get all of Christ's riches, all of God's riches on Christ's behalf. That's what grace is. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside and he lifts us up. If you've never opened your heart to that, that's the invitation today of one who comes alongside you and gives that to you. Um, I remember years ago watching a late night show, and they had Howie, uh, Howie Mandel on there, and he was, it was at the Olympics, and he was on location, and um, he was kind of this guide, but he, was, he wasn't showing people around. He was drawing the maps, but he drew people maps that were like this big, okay? And so he hands people these maps that's like the size of, you know, the first digit of your finger, and he says, here you go. And then, like, people would come back, you know, they're looking for the ski jump or whatever, the Winter Olympics, and they come back, like, half an hour later, and he, I can't find it. He's like, well, you're holding the map upside down. You know, you gotta go like this. And, and it's just this comedy of errors. And, like, the, the promise of the Holy Spirit given is not someone just saying, hey, turn left and turn right, but God's saying, I will be your guide. I am gonna come alongside you in life and be with you every step of the way. There's a really interesting story about this that you, you can look up when you get home. It's the story of a guy named Alan Anderson. And uh, he was 24 years old. He was flying in an aircraft with just one other person, the pilot. And maybe some of you have had this nightmare. Uh, as they were flying, the pilot had a heart attack and dropped dead right in the plane. And so here he is. He's 2,000 feet in the air. He has no flying experience of his own. And somehow he managed to figure out how to get a mayday call out. And it's an incredible story. There was a guy named Robert Leg. Lege or Leg, who's a flight instructor, he heard the call and responded and managed to catch up with this guy with Alan's plane 2,000 feet in the air. And so they're flying side by side. And we actually have record of what they said because an amateur radio enthusiast named Howard Day was listening and he hit record. And so it's a phenomenal story. And um, here, here, we're just going to jump in at the recording when um, Lege catches up and these planes are beside each other. And Lege says to him, this instructor says, okay, you can see me here, you can see me. Okay, listen to my instructions. Take the throttle and pull it slightly until the RPM slows to about 2,300. Well, which is the throttle? Anderson says, okay, okay, there's a black lever in the center of the panel. Just, just let the airplane fly itself, it's okay. And, and Alan says, I wish it would fly itself. And he says, okay, okay, read the airspeed, 105. Okay, look to your right hand, can you see me? Okay, relax. Are we going down? Yeah, 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 we're, we're going down shortly. Just bank the airplanes gently to the right. We're aiming for that large runway. Can you see it? The red and white lights, can you see it? Affirmative. Affirmative. Okay. Reduce the power slightly. What's your speed now? About 100. Okay. Pull very gently on the center column. Close the throttle and hold it there. And he's guiding them in. He says, pull back gently. Hold it. Hold it. Hold it. Hold the control column back. That's it. Relax. Now on the rudder pedals, you will find the brakes. Press the pedals together. And this guy, Alan, says, I can't find the brakes. He says, okay, okay, don't worry. The emergency crews are just coming up behind you. Sit in the aircraft, leave the engine rumbling. And he says, oh, thank God, thank you. And this instructor says, you're welcome. All in a day's work. And there might be things in your life that you kind of feel like you're flying a plane that you've, you know, you're not a pilot. And that's a picture of what God's willing to do through his Holy Spirit. And, and not even in a plane beside it. It's like he gets in the cockpit with us and says, hey, I'm here to guide you. I'm going to guide you every step of the way through situations that you don't understand, that you can't comprehend, situations that are bigger than you. I am going to be there. And for some of you, if you've never opened your heart to this, you really need this. This is God giving himself to you. What's amazing about our society is that, you know, we see people now through Instagram and social media, we see this more often, but um, you see people that have Everything that we're running after, everything we're searching, they're filling their life with it. They're filling their life with train loads of celebrity and money and success and possessions. And at the end of that, they still say, I'm hungry. It's not enough. And you say, how is that possible? You have, every, you have billions of dollars. How can you, right? How can you still be empty? Well, the hole inside of us is God-sized. You could put the whole universe in it and it wouldn't be enough. 
and you've been made by God, and you've been made for God, that is the Holy Spirit given to live inside us, to fill up that hunger. The Bible ends with this invitation in the book of Revelation. The Spirit and the bride, which is a symbol for the church in this book, it says, the Spirit and the church say, come, come, come. Let anyone who is thirsty, if you're thirsty, if you experience this cosmic loneliness, if you experience this hunger, come, drink freely from the water of life. This is the cure for that emptiness we feel. Come experience this deep relationship. Come experience love surpassing knowledge. Experience access to God the Father by the work of the Holy Spirit in our life. Come experience the Holy Spirit helping you pray. Come experience the Holy Spirit teaching us the Bible, transforming us, being a guide and a friend every step of the way. One of the oldest prayers of the church is a very simple prayer. It simply says, come, Holy Spirit, come. I need you, and I encourage you to pray that prayer in your life today and maybe every day going forward. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we are just overcome by uh, what you've given us, what you've sent. And uh, I just want to start by confessing that sometimes we get preoccupied with just small things and things that don't matter, little things that... um, Um, are not anything compared to the gift of the Holy Spirit that you've given us. So forgive us for pursuing small things that just really don't matter eternally. I pray that you would help us to pray that prayer with earnest. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our lives. Show us areas where we do need to repent. Show us areas where we do need to be encouraged and feel your love. For people here that this is just such a foreign concept, would you show them just how to take a first step to open their heart, to open their hands, and say, Holy Spirit, come and live inside me. I pray for people that are trying this out and experiencing this for the first time, that you would make yourself very real to them. And they would know and we would experience this love surpassing knowledge. Thanks, Jesus, that you said you're going to be right beside us, guiding us on. And so we look forward to that in faith. We ask this in your name. Amen. Hey, once again, thanks for watching. Now, if you've never attended one of our services, we would love for you to connect with one of our Sunday gatherings, either in person or online. For service times, as well as information about our fabulous children's and student programs, visit us at oasischurch.ca. Thanks again for watching, and we hope you have a great week.